Hi, welcome back to the shop. Um, you might guess it, today I want to talk about slitting saws and wheel cutters. Um, I think all of us are familiar with slitting saws, like this, and with wheel cutters or staggered tooth cutters like this. Um, these and these are used to cut thin, deep slots into work pieces, cut off work pieces, um, cut narrow grooves that would be very hard with an end mill and stuff like that. Um, the slitting saws are generally very thin and only cut on their outer uh, perimeter. You can only go down like this with them. Um, they don't cut on the sides and they are um, relieved to the center. They are hollow ground to the center normally. Um, you can get them in different diameters like uh, these one. These are a bit bigger. This is a 63 millimeter one. Um, smaller, smaller. These are uh, 40 millimeters with 0.3 millimeter thickness down to um, this is a 0.2 millimeter slitting saw and when you have to cut a 0.2 millimeter slot this is your best uh, your best uh, shot for it um, I used 0.2 millimeter end mills and I can tell you it's no fun it they they break if you watch them at the right, uh, if you look at them on the wrong angle, they just ping and break off. So slitting saws are very useful. You can get them in high-speed steel. All of these are high-speed steel, and you can get them in carbide, and then they are pretty expensive and pretty fragile. Um, they are not super expensive. A new a new slitting saw costs about 10 to 30 bucks and they last quite a time and you can have them resharpened so you get a lot of life out of them. Um, I use the one millimeter thick ones a lot to cut slots for clamping mechanism and stuff like that and that's one of my general purpose slitting saws. Um, you can get them pretty thick. This is a three millimeter thick one with smaller diameter and you can get tiny ones. Um, this one has about this one has 10 millimeter outer diameter, a 4 millimeter bore and is uh, 0.5 millimeter thick. This is used to cut um, o-ring grooves in internal o-ring grooves and I use them actually for this purpose and they work great. Um, on the other hand you can get staggered tooth cutters like this and these are real milling cutters. They have um, they don't only cut on their diameter they also cut on the face so um, they cut a very uh, they cut a slot that's very precise in thickness has very clean walls and you can actually um, machine sideways with them, of course with a, a pretty low depth of cut, but you can cut a shallow groove with a radii with these. Um, I have done this, this works very well, but you have to be careful as these are really expensive. I, um, a new staggered tooth cutter, these are all pretty small ones with 50 millimeter diameter and about two millimeters in thickness. These are about 50 bucks and more new. You can get them often on eBay in bulk, but often you have to be careful. Often you get these kind. These also are wheel cutters and they are not staggered. Every tooth cuts on the diameter and on both faces and these tend to um, um, to cheddar. They work also. These are uh, USSR, so uh, Soviet Union tooling. Um, these are not bad, but you have to be a bit careful with those. Um, 
I prefer the staggered tooth and you can uh, you can't buy these anymore new um, I, I don't think anybody sells the um, with the straight teeth anymore you and, and most of the tool catalogs I have seen there are only the staggered tooth ones and the um, normal slitting saws. Um, and then you, <laughs> this is an improvised slitting saw. This is a, an, an 80 millimeter saw blade from a miniature circular saw with braced on carbide tips. And this works awesome in aluminum and plastics. You can run it at about 1000 RPMs and feed it in. Uh, you, can, you can bury this tool in material and it will cut freely. It's, um, it's cutting with pretty low uh, forces and it works great. But it's, it's a bit scary when it's running at 1000 RPM and you shove it into the aluminum. Um, but I want, what I wanted really to talk about are the arbors for the slitting saws and the wheel cutters. Yes, you can use a slitting saw and just put it on to a normal combination or shell mill arbor um, when you use enough um, distance rings on your arbor. But the problem is um, when you have to work close to your vise you have this you have some of the um, rings and maybe a big washer and a screw head sticking out from the saw blade and that uh, you can't get close to the vise and most of the time your setup is um, is in a way that you have to get close to your vise so often this doesn't work um, if you get enough clearance, this works perfectly fine. What I did is I made these arbors. Um, they are turned, tur they are turned from uh, high strength bolts, big, big uh, M22 threaded bolts. Uh, and this material turned really nice, and it's high strength and doesn't. Um, Produced just a nice finish. Um, the the screw that holds the saw blade on is has two spanner holes, and they even made a small spanner wrench or um, two pin wrench to loosen them. And the design is very simple on these. Just the saw blade. Um, the screw has a big head. A diameter a shoulder with where the diameter is close fitting to your saw blade in this case this is a 10 millimeter arbor and then there is a metric fine thread I choose I have chosen to do it with a fine thread because um, um, the fine thread has a, a better feel to it when you tighten it down and um, the other side the arbor has of course a the diameter of the shoulder closely fitted board out and then the thread behind it and you have you know, if you look close you can see that I relieved the inside of this face to a, to a rim of about three millimeter um, width, and I did this so the saw blade only gets clamped on the other diameter, and this gives way better stability and um, holding power, and makes for a truer running arbor. Um, same here on the screw. It's maybe a bit hard to see on camera, but uh, inside here it's relieved. And due to its design, it can take um, saw blades from about four millimeters down to zero. 
and it has 60 millimeter straight shank and you just clamp it in a in a normal uh, in, a, in a collet in a ER 25 16 millimeter collet like in my more staple 4 collet chuck like this and you clamp it put it in your machine spindle and you're ready to go runs very true runs and and you can extend it quite a bit out if you have to reach down on the side of a vise or something like that works great and i have one with uh, uh, this is a 16 millimeter one and you can see the big flange on this because with 16 millimeters you also get bigger saw blades and i have a 10 millimeter one and i also made a 8 millimeter one where at the moment this pretty small saw blade is clamped in and these served me very well and i still use them but there is one drawback for me it's the 16 millimeter shank on here because i use most of the time morse taper 2 collets in my mill i always have to change to a morse taper 4 collet chuck um, the Morse taper 2 collets only go up to 12 millimeters, so I have to change around all the time and get a bit boring. And what I want to do is I want to make a set of new saw arbors. Okay, here are my sketches. I want a these are the saw arbors. Here is the bigger design for 13 and 16 millimeters with a Morse taper 2 shank because with the 16 millimeters I will also use the staggered tooth cutters and I don't want to clamp this in a collet anymore um, and down here is the design for the smaller saw blades with a 8 and 10 millimeter bore and this is just a straight arbor with a 12 millimeter shank that I can clamp in a uh, Morse taper 2 collet, the shoulder bolt which goes into the board diameter in this um, arbor and with a metric 6mm thread to hold it all together. Pretty simple piece. Um, only thing you have to do is to be careful that you get your run out between the arbor and this, um, this board diameter. Um, so you get this right and also the run out on, on this face this needs to be needs to be running true to the diameter um, or square to this diameter or otherwise your saw blade would be wobbling and cut a wider slot or it would run out um, the staggered tooth cutters don't, don't run out, uh, don't walk off your cut, but the thin city slitting saws are prone to walk off and cut on a curve. And if you go far enough, they will break. And uh, yeah, not very dangerous because the mass of the um, fragments of these little slitting saws is pretty low, but still annoying. Don't break these. Don't do it. Um, so let's get started, cut off some material. I'm using 42 Chromo um, S6, which is a uh, like a stress proof steel, I think. It's, um, and it's with sulfur, so it's free cutting and free machining. I actually never machined that stuff, so this might get interesting for me. Okay. Now we're over at the lathe and uh, machined already the first of the arbors, at least half of the arbor. We start out by chucking a piece of raw material in this recharge I can just uh, machine down this diameter to 12 millimeters. Um, like this to give us to give us a diameter where we can hold on with the collet and the milling machine later. So, 
clamped up the second piece. The material, by the way, machines beautiful. This is a nice, very controllable chip. This just runs off the front of the lathe and drops on the floor. Um, I would prefer it if it would be a bit shorter breaking, but it's, it's quite manageable. Uh, as also this one with a bit more depth of cut came off pretty nice and yeah, looks cool. Okay, you saw me take a pre-finishing pass so I can measure it. And we aim for 12 millimeter minus 2 hundredths. Um, 12.16 in front here and 12 point... Yeah, 12.167 back there. 12.163 in front here. So if you take off... 0.16 millimeters we leave some room for polishing and everything's good Okay, what we get here is 12.01 and 12.01. So we have about one hundredths, one or two hundredths of a millimeter left on there for polishing to give it a nice shine. Um, if you notice that I turned this one with the insert, I finished it with the insert, and this one is turned with the carbide, the braced carbide tool. Um, the, the one I turned with the insert tool looks shinier, and that's because the, um, the carbide insert, the geometry of the insert is not as freely cutting as um, a sharply honed tool no matter if it's high-speed seal or carbide. The insert is almost burnishing the surface and that's the reason why you get always this high gloss finished surface when you turn with inserts. And even if you get a, a super fine finish with high-speed steel or braced carbide, it always looks a bit mm, dull, dull. Okay, let's put a nice uh, radius on this corner. Some cutting oil. Uh, low RPM. And the radii gives it just a nice appearance. Now we add the 45 degree transition to the bigger di diameter with a chamfering tool and we have to do this in a few steps because um, my lathe would jump off the table if I, if I tried to cut a Dutch, such big chamfer in one cut.
Okay. Okay, that's a, a pretty good rate, a pretty good chamfer there. Um, and before we uncheck the piece, there is one important thing to be done. I have to turn a small portion of this bigger diameter true to this uh, diameter down here, so we can indicate when we flip it around. Okay, this gives us a true running surface, true to this, to indicate on when we flip it around. So, let's go. Okay, off camera I machined them to length, 70 millimeters. This one got a bit short, 400 of a millimeter, but that doesn't matter because it's just the overall length. Um, the diameter of the, of the shank is very very precise. Of course the measurement with the calipers is <laughs> uh, almost worthless. So let's do it again with a proper tool like the, I mean, the Toyo dial mics, digital mics. And here we have 11.99 11.99 and here we have Yeah, this is this is twelve, and here we have twelve. So these fit very nice into the collets. Now we can machine. Now we can chuck them on this side. Uh, machine the other diameter, drill it, tap it, and bore it to the final diameter. Okay, back at the lathe, and we will chuck the piece up. And as usual, I like to rotate the parts when I clamp them. That uh, so, when you do this, you you get the feel if there is something between the jaws and your workpiece, like a burr or a small chip. And if it feels subtle and firm, you know that there is nothing that compromises your grip and you clamp it and of course this will run off like crazy um, because this is only a three jaw chuck but I showed this before and I will show it again um, you can bump uh, a chuck through if you have some play on the register of your of the spindle flange and I do this by loosening the, the nuts that hold the chuck slightly. Then I set up my dial indicator or dial test indicator. And get a reading up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, recheck the piece and we have about 200 centimeter run out. Okay, that's again showcase effect. And note that I have the contact tip of the DTI here on this machine surface that we machined in one setup with the shank. And as you can see, this is pretty darn good for a three shot chuck. Um, but I think we can do better, at least a bit. And I use a copper drift. That looks, that looks pretty darn good. Uh, now I tighten the nuts on the chuck 
and we're good to go. That's the next best thing if you don't have a colored chuck or a, four, uh, a proper four char chuck with individual setting on the chars, which I don't have. Still not. Um, yeah, now we can do our machining on this side of the workpiece and we have very low run out. This bigger outer diameter is a, is a non-functional diameter, so we just turn it down to... Uh, we turn it down to 19 millimeters. This is 20 millimeter stock material, but I, want the, I don't like the stock surface. So we take a cut down to 19 millimeters, or two cuts. Yep, we raise the burr back there. So we take our small needle file. And remove it. Yep, that feels better. We will give this a, a rub down with uh, emery paper when we're done. Just polish the non-functional surfaces again. Now we can drill and tap it. Okay, we went in 25 millimeters. Now we can open up the hole to nine millimeters and then we will bore it to 10 millimeters to give it a nice uh, uh, good so to make it run uh, true and i don't care very much that there was almost only one chip in the flutes of the drill bit for me a drill bit is a roughing tool a, a totally and absolute roughing tool nothing more um, they are good for bolt holes but if i need anything more precise i need at least a reamer or go back and single point bore it which is the most precise way to create a round, true and on position hole. Not with a drill. At least not with a, a normal twist drill. There are carbide drills that that drill that almost uh, produce a hole that's like bored. Okay, I just bored out this front diameter to 10 millimeters using one of these solid carbide miniature boring bars. These are made by um, P-Horn. I will, I will link down in the description. And these, they look like this. They have this weird shaped shank, which you have to make a holder for. But they are solid carbide. Most of them are drilled through for coolant. You can run coolant through them. And um, yeah, they are easy to reshop. And this is actually internal grooving tool. This is a boring bar or a, a inside turning tool. And there are also threading tools and a lot more um, shapes and types. But they show up frequently on eBay used and they are super easy to resharpen as they are solid carbide. And you can sharpen them that well that you can take a 100 millimeter cut reliable in um, in steel. So turning uh, close fits with those is a piece of cake. And just to show you what I did, or <laughs> what diameter I turned, take a measurement. This shows 
10 and slightly over zero, about 10.005 millimeters diameter approximately. And if I use a 10 millimeter dowel pin, which is slightly oversized, yeah, a dowel pin is about one hundredth of a millimeter oversized generally. Um, this almost fits it. it uh, I I could I could push it in, but then I would struggle to get it out again. Um, and that's that's really the perfect fit for what I want, because the screw, the shoulder bolt I'm turning will have the diameter two hundredths of a millimeter smaller than than ten millimeters. So we get a nice slip fit and a nice fit on our slip uh, slitting saw when we screw everything together. So that's <laughs> I'm very happy with that. And now for the important part, we have to relieve the center of this face so we clamp only on the outer diameter okay i'm using the insert the tool and we're just relieving the center and leave a rim or a, a ring surface around the bore uh, with about uh, a width of about two millimeters I cut this uh, recess two millimeters, uh, point two millimeters deep. The, the the exact depth doesn't matter because it's a relief. Okay, not much to see here. We're just running the six millimeter tap, and I got asked which taps I use. I prefer these sparrow flute machine taps for pretty much all all all, all threading I do. Um, I, I use them by hand in the cordless drill and also in the machines. Of course, in the machines because it's a machine tap, but um, they they pull the chips back. They check them nicely. You can go down onto the bottom of a bore pretty close and it's just a nice tap and you see the nice chips that have formed here and get ejected by the tool uh, no need for chip breaking with these tabs. You can just run them in and out and you're done. Um, what most people don't realize, they have a maximum depth of threading. Um, for these it's two times the diameter, so with a 6mm tap you sh should not tap much deeper than 12mm or it can bind and break and yeah can ruin your day <laughs> so. and i just uh, watch the depth gauge on the uh, tailstock to see when i bottom out so there we go that's the that's the finished arbor without the Without the screw, we have the shank, we have the um, board diameter, 10 millimeter diameter, and in there we have the 6 millimeter thread to hold everything together. Um, I will drill and bore the second one off camera, and in the next episode, we will talk about the uh, shoulder bolt and um, the use of slitting saws. We might do some cuts with them and show you and talk about speeds and feeds. So 
Thank you for watching. See you next time.